Welcome to Things Concerning Himself on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. I'm Pastor John Anderson. Thank you for joining us today as we continue to explore the Old Testament for pictures of Jesus because he himself said, they testify of me. And of course, the only scriptures that uh, were in existence at that time were the Old Testament writings. You remember also that he joined up with the two travelers on the day that he was brought forth from the grave. He caught up with them and uh, opened their eyes to deeper meanings that they had not seen before concerning the Messiah and his mission. And when he had done so, they confessed themselves, did not our hearts burn within us? And I have to say, that's the only time I can think of when heartburn is a good thing. But we desire that same experience to see Jesus in the pages of the Old Testament and have our hearts be warm, to be burning with love and appreciation for what he has done and what he is doing for us today. We're going to go back in our study today and look at the the tabernacle structure, and focus our attention on one particular room, and that is the most holy place of the sanctuary, the very throne room of God. So I invite you to bow your heads as we pray, as we start. Lord in heaven, we confess that we are weak sinners. We are in need of restoration and healing. Today, as we consider the plan that you put into operation to construct this sanctuary, a teaching instrument by which we could know more about you. We pray that our hearts will be warmed and that our hearts will burn with new fervor and enthusiasm and zeal for your great love. Be willing to share it with somebody that we meet in our life. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The tabernacle was constructed in the time of Moses about 3,500 years ago. And it consisted of two compartments. The first part was called the holy place. As you walked through the veil, of course, the veil represented the door, Jesus, the access, the way. Uh, the table of showbread would be on your right, the altar of incense in front of you, and the lampstand on your left. The first compartment, the holy place, uh, represented how we grow in Christ. And we do that by feeding on his word. That's the table of showbread, the lesson of it. We do that through prayer. That's the altar of incense. Our prayers rise and are joined, are mingled with the, in, the merits of Christ, make them acceptable. And we walk in his light and we study his word to uh, learn the truth about God. So these are all things in the holy place that tell us how, how we can grow in our Christian experience. God puts us right through the sacrifice of Jesus made on Calvary, illustrated by the altar of burnt offering out in the courtyard. But he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants, to, wants us to grow in our experience, not stagnate, but become more and more like Jesus. So everything in the tabernacle had to do with Christ as the ideal. He is the light. He is the bread of life. His, his merits are what join with the, the prayers on the altar of incense. It has to do with Christ as the ideal. But as pertains to you and me, it's the objective, what he wants us to grow into. So the holy place illustrated that growth in Christian experience. The Bible calls it sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus. But then there was a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And that is what we want to look at today. What was in the most holy place? What are the lessons that uh, are conveyed by the uh, article of furniture in there? What does that have to tell us about Jesus? What does that have to tell us? Uh, about our own experience. That's what we're looking at today. Inside the most holy place, there was only one article of furniture, and that was the ark. Today, we're going to look at what was inside of it, how it was put together, and the lessons that pertain to it. It's interesting that right after the Lord told Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, it's right after that in Exodus 25, 8, that it describes the, the ark and the most holy place. It's as if that was uh, the top priority. That was where it was all going to come into focus. And uh, we believe that that was the center of their encampment. The most holy place and the ark and what was in it was at the very center of their encampment. And that teaches a lesson in itself. Now, the ark uh, was given more than one title. And we're going to take a look at that also in our study today. It was called the, the ark of... The Ark of the Testimony, and it was also called the Ark of the Covenant. And we'll take a look at what those terms meant. Above the, the Ark, there were cherubim. And they were fashioned so that their wings touched. Two cherubim, their wings touched in the middle, their wings stretched out to uh, touch the side walls. And they were positioned so that their faces were looking downward at the mercy seat. And we'll talk about 
uh, what that meant. The visible presence of God, which was the only source of light in the most holy place, dwelt, the Bible says, between the cherubim. That's where God's presence was, the Shekinah glory, as we call it. Now, the most holy place, we are told, uh, was 10 cubits wide, 10 cubits long, and 10 cubits high. So the dimensions of its uh, height, width, and breadth were all the same. And what this reminds us of is how the Bible describes the city that God has made. In Revelation 21, 16, it says, it's referring to the New Jerusalem, its length, breadth, and height are equal. So if you can get this picture in your mind that the outer courtyard represents us coming to God first, justification, being put right with God. The holy place represents as we grow in Christ, sanctification. But the ultimate goal is for us to be in the presence of God. That's what God has wanted all along, that the, the separation caused by the virus of sin will have been completely eradicated and we can dwell with him. He can dwell with us. And that will take place when we live in the New Jerusalem. And so the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, the very same as far as its length, breadth, and height, uh, are reflected in what we see in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. The only light that uh, existed in the most holy place was the glory that came from God's presence. And that reminds us also of, of how when this is all fulfilled, uh, the only light for the new Jerusalem, at least the only need for light, will come from God's presence. Reading from Revelation 21, 22, and 23, it says there will be no need of the sun. It doesn't say there won't be a sun, but there won't be any need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, the new Jerusalem, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. So only source of light in the most holy place, the presence of God, and the presence of God in the new Jerusalem, uh, meaning that there's no need for any other source of light there. What a beautiful plan God has that he can restore the fellowship, the communion, the intimacy that was lost through sin, all made possible because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful plan. I hope that you have committed your life to him and are looking forward for the fulfillment of that plan in your life. Inside the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary, there was only one article. It was the ark. And it was two and a half cubits in length, one and a half cubits in width, and one and a half cubits in height. So it was a little less than four feet uh, in length and a little less than, three, less than three feet in height and in width. Can we learn anything from the dimensions of the ark? Well, it's curious that this height of one and a half cubits we find uh, in all three divisions of the sanctuary. We find it in the ark. The ark was one and a half cubits high, a little less than three feet. And we find it in the holy place because the table of showbread was also one and a half cubits in height. And out in the courtyard, we have the altar of burnt offering and the altar itself was three cubits or almost six feet tall. But the level at which the sacrifice rested when it was being offered was at one and a half cubits. So if you see it this way, if you have your eyes open in a spiritual way, you can see that whether you're in the courtyard, you've just come to God and you've just accepted Jesus' sacrifice or whether you're uh, in the holy place and you're feeding upon his word or whether you're ultimately we are with God in the kingdom, in a sense, we're at the same level because when we come to God, he, be, he sees us as we will become in Jesus. We're at the same level at any point in that sense. Now, of course, he wants us to grow in our character development, development before, but as far as our standing with him, when we come to God in the courtyard or when we feed on his word in the holy place or when we are with God uh, in eternity, our standing with God will be at the same level, will be accepted in Christ. What a beautiful thought that is. How was the ark made and what does that teach us? The ark was made of a type of wood that was called acacia wood and it was overlaid with gold. And we've seen this before. The boards that formed the walls of the tabernacle were wood, acacia wood, uh, overlaid with gold. The altar that was out in the, in the courtyard was wood covered with bronze. In the holy place, the uh, table of showbread was uh, acacia wood covered with gold. And what is the lesson of that? Well, wood is something that uh, can deteriorate, can burn, is combustible. 
Uh, on the other hand, gold is more enduring. So this combination of wood and gold, the Lord is trying to tell us that it represents the union, the combination of Christ's divinity and humanity. Now think about this for just a minute. God had a, a great challenge when sin came in. He wanted to save his creatures, but he had to devise a system in which the integrity of his law remained intact. And how could he do that? Well, a divine law had been broken. It was the Lord God that said, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree. A divine law had been broken and only a divine sacrifice could atone. Please, if you don't remember anything else that we talk about in this series, keep that thought in mind. A divine law had been broken. Only a divine sacrifice could atone. This means that Jesus had to be fully and completely divine, fully and completely God, equal with the Father, and yet at the same time somehow human. Deity cannot die. When the Bible says in John chapter 1, in him was life, it's referring to the fact that he is the epitome, the essence of life, and deity can't die. So how could a sacrifice be made when it had to be made by a divine being? Well, it was this mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of godliness, as the Bible describes it, that meant that Jesus came and was born into the human family. He retained his divine nature, even though the attributes were not used during his life. He set aside his omniscience and his omnipotence. But he was fully divine, so he could make a perfect sacrifice, but he was also fully human so that he could suffer and experience pain and, and trials, temptation, and die on the cross. And in this miraculous, mysti mystical way, God was able to provide a solution for the sin problem. And that's illustrated throughout the sanctuary. The sanctuary is all about how God is solving the sin problem. And that's illustrated so often as we see wood covered with gold or covered with bronze or what it might be. And the ark in the most holy place was this acacia wood covered with gold, teaching the union of divinity and humanity, exemplified perfectly in the life of Christ, but also the objective for you would be that human strength combined with divine power can bring victory in our life, as it was uh, illustrated in the life of Jesus, and as it was typified in the very ark itself, because it says in the Bible that around its top you should put crowns, and what did the crowns symbolize? They symbolized the victory of God's kingdom in this battle, this warfare against Satan and sin and the darkness that he had brought about. So what a, what a beautiful lesson. It's the very same lesson that was taught in the burning bush, uh, which Moses encountered uh, as he was commissioned to go back to Israel and, and redeem the people. There you have the bush, something combustible, and yet not burning up. It was because the presence of God was there. So... The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, uh, brought out these lessons in a very forcible way. How was this Ark to be transported? Well, uh, the tabernacle was built so that it could be portable. It could be dismantled and carried from place to place. Whenever the cloud that was above the encamp encampment moved, then it was time to pull up stakes and uh, transport the tabernacle and all of the tents of the people and so on to the new place that God would direct it. They were out there in the wilderness, we know, for 40 years. And throughout those journeyings, uh, just about once a year on average, uh, they moved. So along with everything else, the Ark of the Covenant would have to be transported to the new, new location. How is that to be done? Well, the Lord told them they were to make rings on the outside of the, of the chest, the Ark, and through those rings, there would be poles or staves. They also were made of acacia wood covered with gold. And those staves then were to be positioned on the shoulders of the priests. And they were to transport the ark in this way. And God was very, very specific about this manner of conveyance. And you might remember that a few hundred years after this, in the time of David, when the ark was recovered from having been captured by the Philistines, they brought it back. They didn't follow the instruction that the Lord had given them. Instead, they put it on a cart. And as they were transporting the uh, ark located on this cart pulled by a couple oxen, uh, the cart moved and jostled and Uzzah, walking beside there, reached out to try to stabilize it. And he was struck down and died. And the Bible says that David was very angry at that. He was very mad at God for that. But he shouldn't have been. He should not have been. And later, the Bible says that David becoming 
better acquainted with the instruction. Maybe he'd forgotten it or didn't think it was important. But when he went back and saw that the, that, uh, the instruction was clearly the given, that the ark was to be transported by, by means of these poles going through the rings, the poles resting on the, on the priest's shoulders, David recognized that the mistake was on his part. And uh, he came to understand that God had not acted unjustly uh, by Uzzah's death. So that was how it was to be carried uh, around from place to place. On the top of the ark, on the top of this chest, there was a solid slab of gold called the mercy seat. So you have the chest. It's made out of wood covered with gold. And on the top of the chest, there's resting this solid slab of gold called the mercy seat. Then above that, of course, were the cherubim that were looking down upon it. What was the significance of this mercy seat? What did it mean? Well, it represents mercy. The uh, word that is used in the Hebrew comes from a word that means to cover, to cover in a legal sense, to purge, to make atonement or reconciliation, to bring two parties together. So this represents God's marvelous mercy by which he is able to forgive sinners. In the uh, Greek Old Testament, we call that the Septuagint, it uses the word ilasterion, and that is translated mercy seat when Paul describes this, the uh, tabernacle in Hebrews chapter 9, but it, uh, it also means to propitiate, to be gracious, to be merciful, to expiate, to appease. And there's a related word coming from the same root in 1 John 2.2 2, when it says uh, Jesus is the propitiation or the merciful sacrifice for our sins. Now this mercy seat rested on top of the ark and as we're going to discuss in a minute, the, inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. So because of sin, we have violated, we have broken the Ten Commandments and we stand condemned. But above that law was the mercy seat that sheltered us in type from the presence of God and his execution of the just reward for sin, which is death. So the mercy seat was in between the Ten Commandments and the presence of God. The Ten Commandments, of course, are the foundation of God's government. The Bible says in Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. But God's kingdom is founded not only on justice, but on mercy as well. And that verse continues by saying, mercy and truth go before your face. So we can see this illustrated very accurately in the construction of the ark. There are the Ten Commandments, the foundation of the gov government, the righteousness and the justice being the foundation of his throne. But above that is the mercy seat, and mercy and truth go before your face. So... We have all sinned and we all need the sheltering. We all need the mercy represented by that mercy seat. I'm going to read here from Romans 3, beginning with verse 26. Through God's marvelous, can I say, ingenious plan of salvation, extreme, radical plan, uh, God is able uh, to have the legal right to forgive sinners, something that Satan thought was impossible. But here's how Paul describes this. Reading from Romans chapter 3, starting 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. There's that word that comes from the same root of mercy seat back in the Old Testament. God has set him forth to be the propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just. His integrity has remained. The law is still uh, there and, and uh, stands intact. He might be just and the justifier, the one who can forgive. So in this way, in God's marvelous plan, his law remains intact. The integrity is still there. And yet he has the legal right, because Christ died as our perfect substitute, he has the legal right to extend his mercy. And you see this beautifully illustrated in the Ark of the Covenant. There are the Ten Commandments inside the chest, but then there's the mercy seat, the visible presence of God above it. But Jesus has the legal right to forgive us uh, because of his death on the cross. Now the Ark, as we mentioned, was flanked by these cherubim representing the angels and they faced downward 
uh, their faces uh, exhibit awe and respect and also interest in what's happening. Now, we're going through this coronavirus thing right now, and there are a lot of plans that have had to be put on hold. We can't do that right now. We're postponing that because of this and that. Uh, consider that in the bigger picture having to do with the virus of sin and us being quarantined, incubated here on planet Earth, angels have had to put on hold certain things. We'll learn much more about what angels do when we go there. But one thing is certain that they could be doing many other things right now than what they are doing, which is focusing their attention on helping God's children get through this, this uh, predicament and get to the other side. So the cherubim above with their faces uh, beamed down toward uh, the mercy seat are an illustration of the angels being actively involved in the plan of salvation. One day you're going to meet your angel. And uh, whether it's when you are uh, translated without seeing death or whether you are brought from the grave, probably the first face you'll see is your guardian angel. And you'll understand the deep interest and love that God's angels have had for you and me to be able to get through this situation and, um, and be saved eternally. What a wonderful picture that is. Inside the ark, there were three different objects. We'll go through them rather briefly. Inside the ark, there was the golden pot of manna, and there was Aaron's rod that budded, and then there were the Ten Commandments. Why was the golden pot of manna there? Well, if you remember the story, they came out of Egypt, and before too long, they ran out of food, and they began to murmur and complain. Exodus chapter 16, only a couple chapters after the Exodus itself. And so, uh, despite their murmuring, despite their their uh, exhibiting lack of trust in God, uh, the Lord provided a miracle and manna came down. And uh, it, it came down every single day except on Sabbath. Twice as much came on, on uh, Friday the, the day before. And this manna sustained them through their, throughout their 40 years of wandering. And so the Lord said, I want you to take some of that manna and put it in a golden bowl. Remember the most holy place is all about gold. Uh, being close to God is a precious experience. Put some of that man in a golden bowl and put it inside the ark. It was to be a reminder of man's rebellion and God's providence. People murmuring, complaining, unbelief, God in kindness and love providing for what they needed. So that was what the golden pot of manna was there, a reminder of man's rebellion, God's providence. In a similar way, the Aaron's rod that budded taught the same lesson. It uh, came about because later in their journeyings, there was a rebellion that was instigated by Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now, Korah was a Levite, and he had weighty responsibilities having to do with the sanctuary. As a matter of fact, uh, their family was in charge of when the, the transportation, uh, they had, had charge of dealing with the things from the most holy place. But nevertheless, Korah aspired to a higher station. He, did, he wasn't happy serving where God had put him, and uh, it turns out that in order to be a priest, you had to be of the tribe of Levi, but you also had to be of the family of Aaron. And Kor didn't qualify. He was a Levite, but he was not of the family of Aaron. But he nevertheless was envious of that position. And he began an insurrection and uh, uh, started a, a rebellion amongst the people, claiming that they had equal right to uh, the office that Aaron occupied. But that was not according to the Lord's order. And so the Lord said, I want you to bring every man's walking stick, one per tribe, into the sanctuary. And even previous to this, the leaders of that, of that insurrection perished. The earth opened up and swallowed them alive. But in conjunction with this story, the Lord said, I want you to bring a representative rod or walking stick from every tribe, 12 walking sticks, 12 tribes, 12 walking sticks, and bring them into the sanctuary. And they did. And uh, the next day when they looked at it, an amazing thing had happened. To not, not to 11 of the rods. 11 of the rods came out just as they'd gone in. But Aaron's rod that, that went in uh, budded and bore fruit, ripe almonds overnight. So this rod became a symbol again of, of man's rebellion, but God's providence. This rod could be seen as a token of, of the resurrected Christ and new life that God wants to bring in, uh, into our experience as well. Think of it. There's that dead, dry walking stick that Aaron had been using, and then overnight it becomes a living branch. And in the Bible, Jesus is referred to often as the branch or the rod. 
uh, because he's the one that we lean on uh, throughout this life. The other item in the, in the most holy place was the Ten Commandments. There was a clear distinction made between the laws that had to do with festivals and ceremonies and sacrifices. They were written in a book and they were placed on the side of the ark. But the Ten Commandments were written in stone by God's own finger and they were placed within the chest. Deuteronomy chapter 31 makes that clear. So the Lord wanted to draw a distinction. Even though both laws were important in Old Testament times, the Lord foresaw that there was a, a distinction to be made. And when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? The curtain was torn from top to bottom in the, in the uh, temple there. And God was trying to tell the people that all this system of ceremonies that had been obligatory for thousands of years had now been fulfilled and had come to an end. But the Ten Commandments remain intact. They are God's law in perpetuity. That's why they were written in stone and not on parchment. They were written by God's own finger, not by Moses. And they were placed inside the ark. Now, when it came time for Solomon to build the temple, we're told in 1 Kings 8, verse 9, that only the Ten Commandments were there. The, the uh, golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, were no longer in the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. But the Ten Commandments were there. And when you think about these uh, three items, we can see God's plan for, for you and me. The golden pot of manna represents how we can feed on his word and become nourished spiritually. The rod that budded represents new life, resurrection, and being able to live uh, fruitfully, productively in Christ. And of course, the Ten Commandments in the very heart of the, of the encampment represent how God wants the principles of his law to be within us. I know some teach that the law was nailed to the cross, but that cannot be. Jesus said very clearly that till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle will pass from that law. We're not saved by our law keeping, of course. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. But God's Ten Commandments were written so that we can understand what he is and what he wants us to be. So in the ark, we have illustrated uh, God, what God's plan is for us, to grow by feeding on his word, to experience new life like that dead stick came to life and bore fruit, and to have the principles of God's kingdom implanted in us. In fact, the Bible says in chapter 8 of Hebrews that the new covenant is based on better promises, not the promises of the people when they stood boldly and said, all that the Lord has said we will do, not knowing that in human power that was an impossibility. The better promises are that God says, I will write in their hearts my laws. And through the Spirit, he can do that with us each day. And one day we can live in the presence of God in the new Jerusalem, the fulfillment of his great plan. I hope that's your desire. Bow your heads with me as we close. Father in heaven, we pray for your plan to be fulfilled in our lives, that the principles of your kingdom, the Ten Commandments, will be lived out through the power of the Holy Spirit. May that be our experience day by day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 